I think that's uh, the countdown. Virgil, welcome to BOF Live. It's good to see you in um, snow-choked <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> Likewise, Tim, good to see you as well. Uh, so I have been immersed in imaginary TV for the last day. And it's interesting, we were just talking a little while ago about um, the difference that this year has made to everybody living under the shroud of a pandemic. And imaginary TV would not have happened without this last year, would it? No, not, not in the slightest. And I think you know, what marks the time is obviously like a pandemic has run through our previously existing life, right? And in response to that, I, as a participant in the fashion industry, wanted to use the time to sort of be thoughtful, but also sort of give an optimistic sort of trajectory to these like very uncertain times. And so, you know, fashion shows are a mainstay, you know, an important part of our artistry and, and the industry itself. And so I took a step back and thought like, what's the right construct to show off-white developments? You know, I hadn't shown in a year, basically. So all the collections that I'd been working on, all the, the sort of like, introspectiveness about what off-white means, why is it important, why does it have to exist? You know, I could pour into a construct, not pour into a seven-minute fashion show. You've, you've very deliberately, uh, I mean, the notion of, of, of creating a new TV network, <laughs> in a way, and then giving people a menu so they can choose what they want to watch is, yeah. it's one of those ideas that seems so simple that it's, you wonder why nobody else has done it. But on the other hand, it's one of those ideas that's so simple, nobody ever thinks about it. <laughs> but it feels to me very much like, it, it's very responsive to the moment that in, with Imaginary TV, as you launch an off-white collection, which is the subtext, so yeah. off-white is present. Um, you celebrate solitude in, in, in the various, the yeah. various, films that you that you present it's all about people doing things on their own doing creative and very beautiful things yeah own, which i f i found because i'm in a state of mind right now i'm a little bit i'm a yeah. i'm kind of depressed by by this situation now it has kind of got to me i find that very inspiring and reassuring and i wondered if that was deliberate that you had you have all these people doing beautiful solitary things yeah no definitely and, it, and that stems from reading the room right like it, it stems from being at one with the solitude myself you know I was like a I was racking up the global travel miles you know every meeting I would just agree to and then figure out how to be there you know workaholic is definitely in my sort of category of of like operation but you know like in putting ideas into culture, into the world, you have to read the room and understand the, the ecosystem that we're all living in right now. And, you know, solitude is something that you can run away from. It's something that you can gloss over. You know, we're in social media era, right? So you can post things or you can move at the speed of Instagram, which is very fast. Um, but instead I thought like, this is a time to sort of turn the page, right? You know, and I'm also known for that, like that vibrant millennial spirit that's running and consuming and, you know, moving fast. And I decided to turn the page for Off-White to say slow content, meaningful content, like non soundbite editing, just to sort of be in the zeitgeist is okay because I say it's okay, you know, like, instead of adopting to the pace that the world is existing, it's like someone has to turn the page. And so imaginary TV is very slow. You know, it, it doesn't fit on Instagram in a way. It's, as you know, you know, I could I like have a run on sentence problem, but basically all the ideas and the, the 
inquisition and uh, like the thoughtfulness that goes into off white is is better suited for a platform where those that are interested can sort of just research and spend time with content and not feeling like I have to get in and get out because that's the that's the metric that engagement says is the highest. Now, how much of that was the result of your own experience with kind of hitting a wall a year or so ago where you just, you, as you said, you would go anywhere, meet anyone, <laughs> and I, I don't think you were actually taking, you, you weren't actually checking on how you, you, yeah. were on, yeah. you wanted to be everywhere and do everything. Yeah. And it feels to me that with Vuitton and with Louis Vuitton presentation a few weeks ago and with um, Off-White now, the reflection is really strong. It feels, you did say to me once that everything is you telling your story. And it feels to me that very much, you're very much telling a story now about what's, what, what's meaningful to you in the light of your yeah. experience with having tried to have it all and finding out <laughs> that that didn't work. Yeah. And now you're really, um, you're really taking stock and, and, and actually focusing on what's important in your life. Yeah, it's it's true evolution, right? Like all all things that you know about getting older and evolving, you know, in my mind, take some real looking in the mirror, like being able to objectively look at the body of work and say, this is where I want it to go. And this is actually what it means. So for me, it was like a distinct moment to to pause and to be reflective instead of just sort of continuing to sort of go on a certain path. And I wanted the work to get a different level of depth, right? Like it's, it's a trajectory of man. Like I go from being no one to sort of someone that like on an exponentially curve sort of more people know about, right? But there's always gonna be a disconnect between my true practice and what it's perceived to be. So in order to interrupt that timeline about two years ago, I decided like, let me pause and just sort of like sit and observe. I did a museum show. So that allowed me to go in my archive of work, which I'd, I never look back. Like it's distinctly not in my frame of mind to sort of like look back at projects and dwell on it. But because I had to do that, I decided that there's a certain weight and gravity that my work deserves if I put that focus on it. Um, and so that distinctly results in, you know, Imaginary TV, the last Louis Vuitton show, the show before that. Those are sort of like me writing in my personal journal, but not in page form, but in my work. They, they feel, both projects feel very much to me like platforms that you... You, you've 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 spoken about wanting to bring people up with you, like to use yeah. your to use your success, your profile to elevate others, and they both these projects feel very much like that. You have you have surrounded yourself with people that you are bringing up with you. Um, I guess it feels like there's more of a political sensibility maybe than there was before, but also just generally a greater sense of responsibility, which, which actually yeah. has changed the work quite a lot. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's just coming into form, right? Like the, the sort of ticket that I rode in on within the industry of creativity was that something in the ecosystem has changed, right? You know, 10 years ago when I was going to fashion shows or being in Paris or Milan, there was a sort of rumbling of like, a need for something new, but we didn't know exactly what it was going to be. And I was like content with being on the sidelines and just sort of being in the sort of conversation. And then there was a moment where I was like, I got it. Like the archetype of designer is changing with the times, right? There, there's enough of the ecosystem, whether it's media, whether it's the internet, whether it's millennial spirit, Y2K, you know, this whole societal shift is happening, that means that the archetype of designer with a capital D, artist with a capital A, architect with a capital A is changing. And it takes somebody to sort of shift that. Like 
the archetypes before that were super important to me still are like Yves Saint Laurent, you know, Pierre Cardin, like uh, Karl Lagerfeld, you know, like that era where it's like there's couture, there's ready to wear, you know, or Marcel Duchamp that says, hey, contemporary art is now this, given my findings and what I'm proving as uh, a new basis for, for contemporary art, et cetera. So I sort of took the calling onto myself and started, right? My body of work from Off-White First Show, Pyrex Vision, the, my brand before Off-White, like those are all sort of trial and error, you know, to see where the boundaries lie in this cultural shift. And then like that work surmounts to, you know, the work at LV, the work within Off-White to sort of put something on the table as my findings. So it's, uh, you, I, I mentioned that you use, you, you launched your, your time at LV with a baby. Yeah. And we talked about uh, how this was, the baby was going to grow. Yeah. And it's growing very slowly. You're, 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 you said the baby's at five years now. Five yeah, years yeah. Old. The boy is five years old or something. Yeah, we're at adolescent stage. So what, what has just been happening to the world with the pandemic um, has, has kind of focused that innocent vision, that, that sense of possibility. It feels to me like you are now um, the people you're bringing in to work with you. There's a there's a sort of not a naivety, but there's a um, a, a real a sense of mission that isn't that's completely unleashed that yeah. maybe you didn't even have before. That's no. what I think is interesting. That there's a sense of purpose there now, which maybe yeah. didn't exist before. Yeah, my voice has gotten sharper. You know, like those who know me and my close circle of confidants and friends, like. You know, I'm super driven, but I have an opinion. I have a conviction, right? Um, but it's the ecosystem that sort of forces it like out of me. And like, we can't have this conversation in 2021 without talking about the year that's 2020, right? Like, like this recorded Zoom will, you know, it'll exist as like, hey, what were people thinking at the time after you know, we've seen another civil rights movement. We've seen a pandemic. We've seen economic crisis. We've seen um, tumultuous, to say the least, uh, political uh, happenings. Like my responsibility in my canon is to reflect the times, but also put a trajectory on optimism you know, that's what I task myself with as a creator, as an artist. Like, so as I'm digesting the news of seeing George Floyd murdered in the street, or as I'm digesting seeing the Capitol building um, stormed through, as I'm looking at positive things as well, as I'm seeing humanity rear through, you know, I work with a girl in Chicago named Inglewood Barbie, who's like an unorthodox approach to sort of helping those in need. And when I put my Louis Vuitton hat on and when I put my off-white hat on and speaking for a generation, I want to be known and I want it embedded in the work that I was awake during these times and that there's an optimism ahead. And I think, you know, the biggest task that we saw our fashion industry being called for was what does diversity look like? You know, what does that mean? What is it? What is it, how does it exist and how can it be expressed? You know, me being, you know, one of a minority, I take that to task within the industry. And I, and I, you know, frankly, my creativity is my voice. Like it's much better than me, like reading a, a statement or anything. So that's how it forms in my brain. And is that, would you say that's been a sort of recent evolution for you, a sort of personal evolution, given what happened last year with Black Lives Matter, with, with everything that happened, with the, the election, with, we, yeah. we last spoke, actually, we were speaking while Joe Biden was being inaugurated, inaugurated yeah. last time. And now today, 
um, half the GOP gave Marjorie Green a standing ovation. <laughs> and so we have, the traje trajectories are, are just, that, that's a roller coaster and it's moving yeah. incredibly quickly. So every day optimism is being challenged. Yeah. And how, how do you respond to that? No, for me, like those that are familiar with my work know that this has been the, the sentiment since the very beginning, you know, Louis Vuitton show number one with the rainbow runway, with the models opening the show wearing all white with the same skin tone as myself, you know, or off-white show in the beginning of January with the shirt that says, I support young black businesses. That was a year ago now. Um, it's, it's at the core of my work, but the volume can get louder and more experienced. You know, like to do the show that I've done recently with Louis Vuitton or Imaginary TV, I have to be 40 years old and lived life, you know, and seen things. And that's something that's sort of just me talking to myself. I'm a part, definitely, I'm a part of this like youthful, forever young crew, right? <laughs> like freezing my age and trying to be a 17 year old for forever. And I think what you're seeing is a designer or a person literally evolve in within your midst right like and it takes getting takes stumbling it takes succeeding it takes being misunderstood in order to see a designer or an artist literally take shape in real time and um yeah i think to me it's it's turning a page is that is that's how it feels within myself it's like is this what you is this what you mean is, is this when you talk when you talk about the tourist versus purist thing which is basically your way of talking yeah. about outsider versus insider you were an outsider you were the kid who was yeah. obsessed with fashion who was trying to get into fashion shows yeah. and now you're i was at the, the com de Gar I, I swear to it you must have been there there was the com de garçon show um that me, myself, and all my friends, we were sort of dressed up, there was no other photographers besides Tommy Tan. We showed up to go to Comme des Garçons and everyone was just puzzled. <laughs> They're like, why are you here? <laughs> you know, like, and we were like, hey, this is fashion week, we heard. We wanna, we wanna see what's going on before it's in stores. And that literally was like tourist versus purist. We were outside as tourists, the industry, were purists and I remember my friend Benji B who we both know says the day as we were setting up the Louis Vuitton uh, runway show doing the walkthrough he was like nudged me on the side and he was like he's like you realize you're now the establishment mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that now you you're were, the purist now you're the yeah purist. that you were commentating on so I think now it's I've had time to settle I'm coming to grips with that but then trying to be responsible to keep that door open for a younger generation next to me, rather than act like I'm the purist and the door is closed and you have to do a leap to get in. Do you see that changing? Uh, with, with all the pressure on the fashion industry to, to, to acknowledge that it has, hasn't been a diverse industry, hasn't been an inclusive industry, have you seen it change recently? Do you, over the last, over the last year or so, especially with, BLM, I, I mean, but also with things like Me Too, just a, just a general sort of yeah. conscious, an elevation of consciousness. You have an initiative now, the Postmodern Initiative, which yeah. is very deliberately designed to create access uh, for young POC, uh, yeah. people who want to get into the industry, access, information. And it's, it's extraordinary how the paths of access to the fashion industry aren't really publicized. <laughs> and this is what your initiative plans to do, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I took this, you know, I took the position that I am with, with a, a conviction to change the industry or not necessarily take on the task of changing it as a singular entity, but leading by example, existing by example, like how, if we want the industry to change, how does that change look? And, and, and my natural pace is rapid. 
So if I exist as a model for a type of design, a new way of thinking, a way that it relates to the people, if I also highlight the, the inroads work that's possible to do while doing the design work, then we can actually lead by example. You know, I work for uh, admittedly one of like some great entities within designs, so whether that's Off-White or LV, and they support me. So in turn, they support my initiatives. So Postmodern Scholarship was launched with a million dollars towards POC black students. And the people, the brands that I work with supported me to make that possible. So that's a part of our sustained message. And I ultimately believe that if we want the industry to be as authentic and open the doors and, and be a better industry, it, it requires taking it to task in implementing it. And so I'm not a person that can just sort of say one thing and not practice it. Like I can sleep at night knowing that we're doing the work uh, above and below the ground to sort of make sure there's more me, frankly. Like, and I think that's when I talked about the archetype of designer shifting. Before I started, the knowledge that I had was sort of like, it's a singular entity, you know, like a designer with a capital D, artist with a capital H, sort of channels things that normal people don't see. And, and they exist. And me and the generation that I know is like the next version of me, like literally works on my team today. You know, didn't go to fashion school either, highly ambitious, super creative. And I know maybe 50 of them, right? They will take my position. They will be the head of Louis Vuitton next. They will start another version of Off-White or a media company or whatever. And I'm betting on the fact that if I usher them in, mentor them, that we'll have a better ecosystem over two generations than if I sort of followed the footsteps of the archetype before and was like, I'm special. You know, I don't believe that. I'm, I know my community is special and that's what I'm an advocate for. And I know that LV is a special company for, for believing in me three years before now and giving me the opportunity to paint these pictures, you know, and so that's so on and so forth. So when you talk to LV executives, do you get a sense that they're getting what it is that you want to do, that they see that the, a change has to come? I mean, and they see that you're offering avenues for that change to happen. I mean, obviously one of the, one of the, one of the pitfalls is tokenism. And, you know, one person does it. So, so that's yeah. okay. One person is doing it, but you need a lot of people to be doing it. I mean, what's happening in London with, I, I especially think with young um, female design, POC designers is a total wave, a new wave. Yeah. It's so strong, so creative, so inspiring. But I wonder if you're seeing that in other places. I know it seems with, um, with Imaginary TV and also with the film you made for Vuitton that you are bringing in a global, you're bringing in a global perspective, which feels which feels really, really valuable and, and relevant. It's super important. You know, it's, the, it's, it's what I believe, it's what I exist for. It's what, it's what I built my career for. You know, like uh, people like Michael Burke at LV, you know, mentored me 10 years before now when I was at Fendi in Rome. You know, he, he was an advocate for me and knowing sort of where I could go as I evolved in my career. Uh, and, you know, and I'm a definite sort of, you know, advocate for the way that LV has supported me as a creative. You know, I think it's important to look at the scope that creativity is fostered. You know, they look for artists to be artists, whether it's the LV Foundation or how they've sort of built the entity as we know it. And so I'm able to be an artist. I'm able to sort of articulate my ideas and see them through. Um, you know, it's like, it's, and speaking to the, like, of course, there's, there's realms of like, what's the topic of today? But I always bring up the fact that 
you know, I started at LV, you know, the, the process started in 2017, long before 2020. Um, I remember the day I was announced, you know, there was a sort of resonance, like, like a little bit of like a gasp <laughs> globally, because maybe I didn't fit the prototype. I didn't look like the prototype. And that was a company, you know, I'm really grateful for that opportunity, despite all the things that didn't seem like, uh, like status quo of the time, they they gave me that opportunity. And now we're already three years up and running before we deliver a show like my first show or the sixth show. So I think that the future is gonna be made by bold decision-making. You know, that's what Michael Burke is able to afford it to me. When I look at what's happening in London uh, between Grace Wells Bonner, Martine Rowe, like those are two of my favorite like, I think that they are channeling exactly what the fashion industry needs is a, a diverse perspective, great design. Like it, the, the, the DNA of their output runs through their blood and runs through their ancestry. In my dream that like their success continues on to where they lead houses. You know, I think that they are a new voice that the industry is calling for uh, the industry would benefit from. And, you know, that's why I have, I foster a community. You know, I, I, I'm in close relationships with them, other young designers from all over the globe, because I, I truly believe that the best that the fashion industry will look in this next generation will be like the, the communities of designers that we'd seen in the past. But I think that they, they, they might look different and they might operate in a different way. I'm um, curious about where you see fashion fit, fitting into this, this recontextualization in a way, because what you've done, especially with the last two presentations is fashion is, is part of a spectrum. You've very deliberately included, I mean, filmmaking, yeah. choreography, art, and, and fashion is obviously significant because that's giving you the access, but at the same time, you seem to be redefining it in a way with with all these other creative uh metier. well i told you before this interview started that i was going to equally ask you as many questions because as, as you're going to ask me because this is where i love history you know distinctly for the sort of evolution part of the conversation uh, and this is just a hypothesis right that maybe every 10 years, the industry of fashion needs like a radical recontextualize, recontextualization. So of course, and, and I'm asking, I'll ask you to do the timeline as like which each era occurred, but from couture to ready to wear, and then from ready to wear shows being from this very stoic, very like almost like uh, demure or you know, like, like very austere moment, but no, wait, maybe it's reverse. Like I think of Galliano shows. I think of like exuberance. I, I think of Halston show. I think models that are looking the audience in the eyes and twirling around and yeah. the sort of celebration. Yeah. Then it Kenzo. goes, yeah. And then it goes to like, you walk me through just for all those listening about those different eras. And then I'll pick the baton off. Of well, I think, I think that the, 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 the obvious swing was um, late 80s, the supermodel phenomenon, mid 90s. It went from maximalism to minimalism. And then it went from minimalism to big business. And it <laughs> went the, the, the democratization of luxury. What, and, what years was this? And well, what, I'd say, like, what I'd brand say, and shows? I'd say Prada Gucci, mid nineties onwards, the democratization of luxury. You know, when you could buy the keychain, and that oh. was that was your that was your <laughs> that was literally your key to a to the world of fashion. Minimalism would have been early nineties. Maximalism would have been eighties. Um, uh, but I think what 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 happened was as fashion as as the world found out about fashion through the nineties, and then into the noughties. Um, it, it started to become part of something else. It started to become a, a mass entertainment. 
Yeah. And I think what, what, what we're seeing it doing now is becoming socially responsive in a way it's never been before. It's responding to current events. It always did. Fashion yeah. was always a mirror, but now it's been called on to contribute in a much more substantial way. And I think that is a very, 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 very fierce reckoning for the industry. Yeah. I mean, it's really stand up, it's stand up and be counted time. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's like my, that's my generation, right? So when you take that longer lens view, you realize that, you know, the 80s, 90s, there was things happening societally that contributed to fashion, maybe being smaller and focused on the industry and focused on luxury or what have you. You can't say that for today. You can't say that for 2020, right? Like these, these brands occupy people's lives. Right. And they have a responsibility at a certain aspect to to be responsive or to be in conversation. Um, and that democratization is where that's the door that I walked in on. And so I have a responsibility to 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 my generation in a way that's that I take upon myself. But, you know, imaginary TV was born out of this idea of it's a little bit of a polarized, you know, this is my internal brain speaking, not my recorded interview voice. But when I think about fashion, I think about why does it have to exist? You know, like I can equally celebrate the clothes, but I can actually also look at it being like, do we need another jacket? Like, yeah. what, is the, what is it like? Okay, if my grandparents had one pair of shoes and one winter coat and I have a hundred pair of shoes and 30 winter coats that I can't even wear in the winter. What does that say about what we're, what we're projecting and what we're building? You know, I grew up at a time, you know, I very distinctly remember the United Colors of Benetton advert, like when I first saw it and thought like something's happening here that's not happening around. So when I build Off-White and Imaginary TV was born out of this, it's like remove the clothes from the equation I see Off-White as a platform for artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see it as like a generational, and you know I don't like the term streetwear, <laughs> but I see, for lack of a better term, it's a method of making and a method of existing. This, it's, it, it relates to eye, eye level. It doesn't look down upon people. Streetwear is everywhere. So you take those elements, Off-White is a platform for other artists to be heard and seen. Like if it has 10 million followers on Instagram, like not just commerce, but allowing another artist who might be in the beginning of their career, having that ability to work with a fashion brand to elevate their work and, and showcase the premise. And that's when the light bulb went off. It's like, and that's why I asked you about the history of fashion. Like when you go from couture gown to keychain, where do you go from keychain to to next like is it is it only commerce well i, th I think street i think streetwear was was a step after the keychain exactly. where fashion suddenly trainers sneakers became the handbags the, or whatever yeah they, yeah they became the it shoe the, the it bag yeah. the it shoe. and 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 you have people who are as obsessed with trainers as as there are people obsessed with buying andy warhol paintings or something. <laughs> yeah. sotheby's the prices <laughs> Um, it, 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 it's, it actually, to me, that is just kind of a, a, a weird kind of consumerism out of control. Yeah, like the, like oh, these things here. Those are, <laughs> that's just for candy for the internet. You, you've, been, you've been, think about it, you've been pretty instrumental in all of that happening. Um, and, and so it's interesting when you, when you talk about uh, off-white, when you talk about the tourist versus the purist, and um, actually, you did say something. Where did um, I'll find it somewhere? Yeah. Um, uh, where where you were talking about? Um, oh, the dissonance. How you like the dissonance of the new off-white collection? Yeah. With its roots. Yeah. You know, because I thought what was so so, so interesting about off this collection is everybody else is talking about. You know, like the Fendi collection, for example, or the um, 
the the Xenia collection that we just saw, uh -huh. very much influenced by people being at home, and yeah. a sort of softness and a kind of and a, and a kind of comfort, and a, and and wrapping you for yeah. so you look just slightly better than you would look in a t-shirt and in track pants. You did a very very structured, tailored, very yeah. much not working from home collection, yeah. and that felt that felt quite. That felt really interesting to me because Off-White felt more about the context. It felt more about the imaginary TV, more about the dancers, the artists, yeah. the filmmakers, the theater, the theater people, all the events you staged around the collection, incorporating maybe a glove or a shoe or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. really what you were asking people to respond to was all the artists you'd invited to your platform. Exactly. And, the, and the clothes were quite minimal and quite strict. Yeah. And, and I thought that was kind of an interesting, especially after Vuitton, which wasn't that. Yeah. I thought that was quite an interesting um, statement. Two sides of the brain, you know, like they run on par completely parallel paths when I'm, when I'm in the studio conceptualizing. Um, and, that, you know, like the name Off-White comes from that, right? It's not black or white because it's not black or white, it doesn't mean that it's gray either. So I have this, I have this sort of like way of thinking in my brain that's like, if it's obvious, it's either a good idea or the worst idea, <laughs> right? And so I can iterate between those two. So of course we're in quarantine. You know me, we've talked long enough before all my collections that I, the thing that I take most seriously is the premise. like. The, the the reason you know the whether it's the boyhood for Louis Vuitton like that takes me a long time to figure out and so I I can't build collections just based on obvious non non important not that they're not important but like the fact that we're at home means that we um that the collection should be like loungewear like that doesn't that's not enough for me. You know, there's not like, I'm more concerned with 2020, the uprising due to inequality. Um, so that collection for, for Off-White, it's titled Adam is Eve, and really is like a sort of like the first Off-White collection that I've created that's not menswear and women's wear. It's completely one collection um, styled by Eve, uh, uh, you know, who I've been working with a lot. And so it was like, it has legs that are sort of implanted into what's happening culturally. And then the decisions based from there. And that's what makes it fulfilling as an, as an output for me. That it's like removing the, the commerce part or removing the media draw or, you know, this, the, the hype around it. Like I'm speaking about like how our generation uh, needs to respect the idea of gender, but I'm embedding it in the DNA of the collection. It doesn't have to like, it doesn't have to sort of express it uh, in a way that it's screaming from the mountaintops. It's like, it's literally what the collection is. I thought, uh, I think Vogue, when they reviewed uh, the Off-White show, they talked about um, Vuitton being about race and yeah. Off-White being about gender. Would you agree with that? Yeah, though, you know, my show notes get long, as you've seen, they get sort of tangled. Like, to summarize anything that I'm thinking into just like a bite, you lose a lot of the nuance. But those are... Those are different, um, uh, different sort of ingredients to, to, you could say that. Yeah, like in general, those are a part of the logic system that I created, you know. That's what Adam is Eve, and then the Louis Vuitton was like, as we talked about, it's like a celeb diversity versus monochromatic. Both those issues are entirely dominant. Um, race, I think, probably more than more than gender because it is it is so much more of an issue to deal with in the moment especially with what is happening in America uh, I've always thought of you as being a little wary 
of of throwing your hat in the ring so <laughs> definitively. Yeah. I wondered if that was something to do with turning 40, having this experience with your health, where you know you were exhausted from everything you were doing. That uh, when I said before about standing up and being counted, that basically you you feel that um, you feel your role is now to to offer this leadership by example. That you're more you're more resolute in a way. You're more you're you're braver. Yeah, on my own turn, you know, I think I think what you're seeing me transform into now is like I was only going to do it on my own terms, right? The weariness, you, you've called it out distinctly to a T. There is definite weariness because in a way, I'm not an idiot, right? <laughs> like, I know how these things go. As your personal profile raises, like, all of a sudden, people think that because you have a 5 million followers on Instagram, you should be the leading expert on racial inequality. And I wanna give you a microphone and put that microphone in your face and say the right thing to a whole delegation of people that don't agree and don't say one word wrong. If you say one word wrong, you're canceled, you're out. Like that's how celebrity had been going since long before or notoriety resonance, right? Like, and it's a trap door. In, in essence, like there's there's no way I can be the leading expert on these like, you know, issues for over 400 years just because I'm a fashion designer. And th there's some turbulence to that in my 2020. But uh, where I've gotten more resolute is like my, my um, podium is that 13 minute fashion show. Like I speak in creativity. My podium is imaginary TV. When it comes to being a spokesperson, there's people that have been doing this exact work and dedicated their lives to it. So my job in this situation is to empower them. Whether that means like, whether it's working within trans community, working with people fighting for racial in, uh, equality and removing systemic racism, that's Virgil plus X, Y, Z. But when it comes to like making inroads and, and making scholarship programs and mentorship, that's where postmodern comes in. And I think what I've learned is that like my creativity is my megaphone. Like, you know, I don't need anyone to, to, to uh, like, to, to assist on besides my community. But when it comes to representing these issues that are bigger than fashion, that are ingrained in humanity, that's where fashion, and I'm hoping to lead by example, that's where we can start building bridges and see change. Do you, and do you think that sense of purpose counters criticism? Because God knows you've been slammed yeah. in the course of your career. And you did say that, 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 that that helps you deal with criticism. It's just the, the, you know, people saying, well, you took this idea from somebody, you took that idea from somebody else. Yeah. Um, and, and what you're saying is that when you're motivated by this vision, this sense of purpose, then actually you can cope with the criticism because there is a grand design in the end. Yeah, you said it perfectly. Like what is criticism when, when people of my same skin tone are getting choked in the middle of broad daylight, you know, when there's a kid in a design school somewhere that doesn't feel like they can be the head of a fashion house, like it, when the when when people need assistance for mentorship to figure out how to make their brand profitable, like I think that's the biggest thing to understand about me. Criticism comes with like, you know, like clouds and rain, you know, like that's a fact of life. That's that's too too short minded you know i'm not i'm not definitely in like a popularity contest or something like that like i signed up because i had this like belief mind you i was the bright eyed kid on style.com <laughs> you know like i was telling you before i was looking at these runway shows being like this is it you know like this is an amazing platform i was supposed to be an architect and i was like no fashion is combining all these genres it makes 
it makes people move. It makes people feel a certain way. Like that medium, and this is about, also about the shift that's happened. You know, if I were to ask you this 20 years ago, like the critical opinion might have been the sort of where the, the trophy of the industry lied. And what I'm saying is like critical opinion's fine, but what is my industry? What is my, what, what am I doing to sort of affect the world? That is a different metric than was that collection good or not? You know, and I know in my lifetime or maybe after that legacy of the work is surmount is, is adding up to sort of opening doors. And that to me is the metric that matters. But do you feel ultimately that means you kind of transcend fashion? That that especially looking at imagining TV and, and imagining where you could actually take that idea, because yeah. it's already the, the breadth of it is already pretty extraordinary in in you know a very very short space of time. How do you imagine evolving that idea in the way that you talked about wanting to? What could it become? Yeah, well. That's why I like, like if you pair, mind you, this is the, the most ironic thing to me is to be talking about. <laughs> Cause like, it wasn't until three days before the Louis Vuitton show that I had to, you know, like you called, Sarah Moore called, and I had one other, I hadn't put words to it. I literally was like sitting in this room, sitting in the studios, like just basically deep cross section of my brain making stuff. And then I was like, I have to put words and describe it. So what you're seeing with those last two, and this is 2021, is I'm, I'm trying to step into a new space that is like detached from the 2019 space or the 2020, thereby building things that I don't know what could be built yet, right? And, I, and you're just seeing me sort of trust my intuition in a way that I never have before. Like imaginary TV, from the moment that people were watching it, I'm texting the team. It's like, all right, I want to do a cooking show. I want to find a chef that did to the restaurant industry what I was thinking when I started making fashion shows within fashion, because I know they exist. I want to find artists that don't feel like the gallery model might be their, their means of output. They identify with whatever, hip hop, <laughs> you know, club culture, graffiti, et cetera. And they're like, wait, Off-White isn't just a clothing brand. And it's not, and don't get it construed as like a clothing brand that's just doing a TV channel. It's like, mm -hmm. it's imaginary TV becomes first and Off-White is after. That's just me on my own channel. But like, I literally wanted to call, like Samuel Ross from a cold, or who, or Martine Rose. I was like, I want to air your fashion shows here. I want to do, I want to think about it as a completely new opportunity for a, a generational thing. Well, you, you, you talked about the impact MTV had on you when you were a kid and you're yeah. imagining something similar for this. Are you with a, yeah. a young audience having their minds open to the guy playing Schubert in a field? <laughs> I mean, for goodness sake, that was so, it's, it's random, but it's, it's very, it's beautiful. Yeah. You can see that's the that's the that's like the off-white logic in a different realm with somebody and with another talent, and then making a space where they can be seen. And that conundrum is is powerful. You know, the, the the blending of genres, the freedom, breaking rules, but for the sake of the art, modernizing. I think that's that's what imaginary TV is. And so the clothes are one thing. Imaginary TV is a way to think about where those clothes exist and yeah. why they're even important. You know, when I was looking at it, because there's something eerie about it as well, when it's sitting on the, on your, the screen of your laptop yeah. and you're clicking between all those things and all those people doing things, there's something kind of ghostly, I found. Voyeuristic. And, and then, well, it's voy I guess it's voyeuristic, but it's kind of, I, I suppose it is voyeuristic, but it's more, it's, it feels nicer than voyeurism. <laughs> but it just, it just um, made me think that you're almost like a medium and this is almost like a seance and you're <laughs> hosting this seance with all these spirits coming into people's 
worlds. Um, and that seemed to me a, a, a role that you've created for yourself, both with the Vuisson film, which had a very, very spiritual uh -huh. component, I thought, and with this, that yeah. you have set yourself up as a medium and you are going to introduce a huge, innocent audience to this to a lot of new things and fashion is one of those things, but there's all those other things too. I yeah. loved, I loved the electronic DJ. I loved looking yeah. at these people doing what they do. Well, yeah, you know me, like you've been with me on nights in Milan, just DJing a party that we threw together. Yes. <laughs> like, you know, like that's the real me, like the, 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 and it's community. Yeah. Is bar none what doesn't get talked about enough yeah. in, in my work or in fashion in general. Like, and I don't mean like the group of models sitting at a VIP table, you know, like, I mean like generational community. Like yeah. we, like, you know, I, I would, when I was young, I would go to London and hang out in on Carnaby Street, go to the record store, go to Bathing Ape, just hang out, go skateboarding, go to a club at night, just, this community, you know, these are still my community today. Like scenes are birthed from that. You know, I always dream, you know, I'm, I'll ask you, I was dreaming of like Malcolm McLaren, Vivian Westwood, the sex shop. Like, what was that like? What was happening in Manchester between, you know, Hacienda and whatever, like that, that's the, that's the fertile soil that anything that, you know, studio, like this quarantine, I went through like, Studio 54 and then I jumped to Paradise Garage just to sort of like use this downtime to just like what's the predecessor to the things the glossy things mm -hmm. and the community today is you know it's 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 got its own recipe right there's a lot of young kids raised off the internet with their own education that are you know within arm's reach of a generation like mine, you know, multiple times of 10,000 hours of work, but a young designer f has the full right to feel like they're better than me. You know, that's just the empowerment that comes with today. But I'm interested in the community that's built, again, like I said before, rather than seeming like there's a gate and they have to jump over the gate to sort of participate. Like if you look at who I hire, my teams, like, it's full of just some of the brightest, most avant-garde minds, and I and I, and I take it as my responsibility to 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 offer them platform for their voice, and and that makes me happy. But I, what I think is what I think has been really, really uh, wonderful to see over the last two projects, anyway, is how it's it's mutual. You give them, you give Ib Kamara. Yeah. The, the opportunity to work with you. Caravaggio and, of our times, a Renaissance yeah, painter. I'm incredible, I, incredible. Ib Kamara and Jack Davison have, have completely restored my faith in image making yeah. and fashion. Incredible. They're special. And he, but he has an effect on you. A hundred percent. And you see what you did with those last two shows. You see yeah. a discipline and a coherence. Yeah. And, and that's what it's all about. It's an interchange. I mean, it's a cultural exchange. Yeah. And, and that I find that uh, for all the kids who are watching, um, yeah. that, that the hope in that, the, the, the fact that there is, yeah, you say. And, no, like, and you bring me to a great point. Like when I started my career, the first sort of half, I was always labeled as like a disruptor, you know, like this guy or whatever the term, there was like a sense of like, how do you categorize that versus everything else? And it's kind of like, you know, no fashion school or whatever, but I want to make it clear. Like I'm 50, 50. I love the history and, and, and something important about what you just said, the relationship between designer and stylist is an underpinning of our practice, right? Like I, when I think of great eras in design designers that I looked up to, there was always the importance of the stylist and what they bring to the conversation. And, you know, I found that like working with Eve unleashed like a different sort of uh, a different safety, if that's the word, for me to just dream a little bit more into an unsafe territory, 
right? That Louis Vuitton collection was completely detached from like the right side of my brain that was conservative, right? And that safety came from knowing that Ebe, his idea of safety is 10 times further back than mine, you know? And so there's a trust that the looks are gonna make sense, even if it doesn't make sense to me. And, and my, like, it, I formally believe he is a talent that is like, you know, one of a few of every generation or so. And so that's mm. where you see the language between off-white and that, you know, and, and raising up his voice, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm keen that people, he becomes a household name. That's like, I take that on as like, as much as my own success is like, there's some great kids that have been working and might not, you know, obviously he's, he's known, but there's other ones in different corners that I build my community around. Well, I'm, I'm, we have about a minute left. I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing who else you introduce me to because <laughs> I, I, I work my way through the programming for imaginary yeah. TV. And I, and I, I, I just was, I really enjoyed and felt enlightened, which you don't always, you don't always say when you leave a, especially in this virtual era of fashion presentations. I'm curious though, at this point in your evolution, um, does anything intimidate you or frighten you in any way? <laughs> it's funny, like my honest answer is the first one that popped in my head before I tried to revise it and make it sound good. Um, the only thing that intimidates me is the slippery area between um, between like the sort of like the the gallery right like I definitely feel like I'm in this like social media you know like sensational story that can be made up of non-facts but fits a narrative um you know like between my other friends who operate at sort of like a mass pop culture sphere like there, there's a huge quotient that we're not getting from artists from our time because they fear that the ecosystem can easily take something out of context and, and be used against them, right? Like it's, it's not, there isn't so much freedom to be misunderstood or misquoted or free, you know, to like, to really be on the edge of an idea. So everything is sort of like sitting a little bit tighter and it's done with great purpose. Like, a, like when you ask yourselves like, wait, like if something's happening societally, how come more people aren't coming out and being outspoken X, Y, Z? There's, there's like a different danger and there's like a different way to communicate ideas. So like, that's the only thing like for a person like me, you know, I'm from the Midwest of America, right? I'm not from New York or LA. I'm like, I, that chip in my brain or that part of my sort of existence doesn't exist. Like how to, how to choose your words or exist so that like it, like messages travel. I think that's why you can find like creativity is my best megaphone more so than like any other medium so that's the only thing that's intimidating is like because it's an unknown you, you can't you can't control that well Virgil I think that probably puts us at the end of this conversation and it launches the next conversation that we have <laughs> thank yeah. you very much it was a pleasure to talk to you likewise and always take care see you soon I hope <laughs>